I will be a god compared to you. You will all be animals. You denied me a happy life. And in turn, I will deny all of you life. It's only fair. This is Elliot Roger. He was a troubled young man who felt extremely frustrated by his inability to connect with women. He felt lonely, depressed, and like he would remain a virgin for the rest of his life. He wrote a manifesto explaining that he was the supreme gentleman and how he would make men and women pay for not choosing him as he considered himself a god among men. And in May 23rd, 2014, he tragically resorted to taking the lives of six innocent people. And although his intended day of reckoning didn't unfold as he had envisioned it, it left behind many heartbroken families. This is the case of the King of Incels. Elliot Rogers' story begins in London, England. He was born on July 24, 1991 to his father, Peter Rogers, a British filmmaker and photographer, and his mother, Lee Chin, a nurse who worked on film sets. Their love blossomed through their encounters at work, eventually leading Lee to become pregnant two years later. I think it's also worth noting that Elliot had a little sister named Georgia. In 1996, Elliot turned five years old and their family made a big move to Los Angeles, California. This move was in hopes of furthering his father's career as a filmmaker. By the way, his father actually did work on Hunger Games, the first one I believe in 2012. I'm not exactly sure of his role, but perhaps I'll put it on the screen. Once settled into their new home, Elliot started attending Topanga Elementary School, and by all accounts, he was a well-behaved kid, well-liked, and had many friends. His early childhood appeared to be bright and filled with positivity. However, just after celebrating his seventh birthday, Elliot faced his first major struggle in life. Tragically, his parents went through a divorce, and as a result, Elliot and Georgia had to divide their time between both of them on weekdays and weekends. Elliot, who was already known for being shy and reserved, was generally content, but somewhat lacking in confidence and personality. He always tried to fit in with the popular crowd, hoping to belong. But for some reason why he couldn't understand, he was always pushed away. However, a sudden change in his home life would intensify his insecurities. Just two months after his seventh birthday, his father Peter introduced Elliot to a new woman named Samaya Akaban. Unfortunately, they would frequently argue, and Elliot was resistant to accepting discipline from someone outside of his family. This became a common struggle and created much turmoil in their household. However, growing up, Elliot lived a privileged life. He commonly traveled abroad and was accustomed to getting what he wanted. And despite his material possessions, he only felt more alone as his teen years came and eventually would go on to get bullied at school. In his mind, he was living in constant torment. Although Elliot still had a few friends, his social circle only became smaller. The situation at home also grew more complex. When he was 13 years old, his father and stepmother had another child a son named Jazz, who became Elliot's new stepbrother. By now, Elliot was in his mid-teens, and he created a personal YouTube account called Elliot's Blog. On this platform, he frequently expressed his feelings of loneliness and reflected on his childhood. It's truly a beautiful day, but as I've always said, a beautiful environment is the darkest hell if you have to experience it all alone. During this period, Elliot's journey into depression and loneliness began. Regrettably, the bullying he had experienced at school persisted, and there was even an incident where his classmates taped his head to a desk. These negative encounters resulted in Elliot frequently changing schools, making it difficult for him to form friendships. At the age of 16, Elliot began seeing a psychiatrist. The doctor prescribed him Respiritan, an antipsychotic medication typically 
typically used to treat conditions like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. However, Elliot openly admitted in his blogs that he refused to take his prescribed medication. As he turned 18, Elliot isolated himself more and more. By this point, he had only a small group of friends he interacted with online, primarily on Reddit. He frequently expressed to his parents that he had difficulty making friends in real life, and he felt unnoticed by women, with no one seeming interested in talking to him. And in an effort to improve his life, Elliot made a decision to try two things. First, he would decide to learn how to drive, believing that this would impress women. Secondly, he wanted to better his appearance by dressing trendy, hoping to appear more approachable. And to achieve this, he purchased a new car, changed his hairstyle, and bought a new wardrobe. And it was noticed by his classmates, but Elliot never actually made effort to initiate conversations or forge friendships. Instead, during his lunch breaks, he would sit in his car expecting others to make the effort to talk to him. He spent his time playing video games like World of Warcraft or Halo with his three friends. Elliot began to realize that during his later teenage years, he had harbored a great deal of anger towards the world. What bothered him even more was the fact that he had never been in a romantic relationship or even experienced the simple joy of having a girlfriend. Elliot's perception of other people had taken a toxic turn as well. He openly acknowledged in his journal that whenever he witnessed couples holding hands or displaying affection in public, he would experience intense feelings of sadness and rage. This distorted mindset led to a disturbing incident where Elliot threw hot coffee on a couple that he saw kissing at Starbucks. And while his actions were undoubtedly insane and completely inappropriate, it only led to a darker and more troubling path that Elliot was about to embark on. I'm just contemplating about my life and how unfair it's been lately. Ever since I started desiring girls, but they never desired me back. Life has been a living hell since then. Right now it's spring break. Everyone else my age is out having fun with their friends and their girlfriends. Here I am, taking lonely walks through a park. In the year 2011, when Elliot was 19, he moved to Isla Vista, a coastal community in Santa Barbara, California. Elliot had moved into a house with two roommates. However, it didn't take long for his bitterness and loneliness to seep into his new life. Within merely a week, he grew frustrated with his roommates, and by the end of the month, they had already moved out. Unfortunately, Elliot's situation with his new roommates proved to be even worse. In addition to his deep-seated racism, he would engage in daily arguments with these two individuals. And as his longing for a girlfriend persisted, it would trigger rage in Elliot. It would become a common occurrence for him to run back to his room feeling rejected, crying after witnessing a couple together. But this was only the tip of the iceberg. In 2012, his life continued to deteriorate. It was during this year that he ultimately dropped out of all of his classes. The sight of others finding love was unbearable for him, causing him to withdraw from his academic pursuits entirely. And at this point, Elliot fell into a dangerous cycle of gambling with lottery tickets. He believed that winning the lottery would bring him the attention of all women that he craved. In the first week of February 2012, he spent $100 on lottery tickets. He was hopeful for a big win. However, it never came. Undeterred, the following week, he decided to invest another $500 on lottery tickets, hoping for better luck. Luck was just not on his side. Thinking that a third time would be a charm, he spent another $700 on lottery tickets. And yet again, his efforts ended in disappointment. Elliot had nothing to show for the money that he had spent gambling. And what made matters worse is that he refused to accept defeat. He felt a sense of entitlement, believing that this money already belonged to him. It was just merely his to claim. Following these events, Elliot plunged into one of the most severe episodes of depression he had experienced. And as spring break came, he found himself spending the majority of his time locked away in his room, unwilling to make any attempt to socialize. He was consumed by feelings of anger, sadness, and loneliness. And on the rare occasion where he did venture outside, he would walk alone venting his frustrations into his camera, documenting his life struggles. 
I mean, you give a chance to all these stupid, obnoxious guys, and I see, and I see you walking with. But you don't give a chance to me. Why not? I'm I'm such a magnificent guy. I'm beautiful. You can't deny that. I'm civilized, intelligent, sophisticated. I have a sense of style. And yet you girls don't see it. It's, it's not fair. I deserve them more. I don't understand you girls. It's like your sexual attraction is flawed. It's perverted. This world. And in April 2012, Elliot faced another blow when his longtime childhood friend James decided that he could no longer continue to be friends with Elliot. James found Elliot's radicalism and negativity too overwhelming, which caused him to call off the friendship. And with this loss, Elliot now felt utterly alone. One year later, in September 2013, he went to Best Buy to purchase a laptop. As he waited for the store to prepare his order, he took the opportunity to walk across the road to a local firing range. But little did he know that this visit would mark a pivotal moment in his life. You see, deep within Elliot's mind, he had entertained thoughts of a day of retribution, a day where he would seek revenge against women for denying him of a sex life. It was at this pivotal moment, at the firing range, as he fired his first few shots, that a crucial question echoed in his mind, saying, what am I doing here? And how did it come to this? And initially, this was just the passing thought. However, as the day progressed, Elliot's conviction solidified. He eventually came to the conclusion that humans are inherently savage creatures, and if he couldn't find his place amongst them, he believed that he would just destroy them all. And in his manifesto on that day, he wrote, I didn't want things to turn out this way. I wanted a happy, healthy life of love and sex. But if I'm unable to have such a life, then I will have no choice but to exact revenge on the society that denied it to me. Elliot then decided to purchase a Glock 34 automatic pistol on December that year. And again, during the following spring, he purchased a second firearm. This brings us to July 20th, 2013. Elliot attended a party with hopes of interacting with women. He had spent the previous two weeks working out in his bedroom, believing that it would increase his chances. However, once again, his attempts to engage with the opposite sex were met with indifference. Frustrated and intoxicated, he found himself perched on a 10-foot ledge where people were all gathered. Elliot would then get into an argument in his intoxicated state. Elliot tried to push a woman off the ledge. However, his attempts were unsuccessful, and instead he was forcefully pushed off by the men who tried to stop him. Elliot suffered a broken leg and eventually would have to go under surgery to repair it. And according to Elliot's manifesto, this incident served as a catalyst for him to plan his day of retribution. During the initial months of 2014, Elliot found himself spending the majority of his days outside of his room. He would often find himself sitting in parking lots, watching the sunset, deep in thought, contemplating his own existence. He couldn't escape the sight of couples together, and it filled him with anger. During this period, he started recording himself in and around his car, sharing these videos on YouTube. However, despite his efforts, nobody seemed to take notice or pay attention to them, which only fortified his feelings of being alone. Just a week after Elliot had uploaded that video to YouTube, there was a knock on his door. It was the police. Someone had watched his video and become concerned about Elliot's mental state, thinking that he might be unstable. The officers that arrived at his doorstep had begun questioning him, standing just outside his bedroom door. They asked if he had any suicidal thoughts. Elliot downplayed the situation, assuring them that he was doing just fine. What's crazy that if the police had actually entered his bedroom, they would have found heaps of pistols and ammunition just sitting there. And not just that, they would have found his manifesto outlining his intentions of his day of retribution. But unfortunately, they just never went inside. Elliot's plans for his day of retribution were filled with violence. The plan spanned across two days. First, he intended to drive to his father's house, where he would carry out the killing of his stepmother and his younger brother, Jazz. His stepmother for telling him what to do as he saw it an opportunity for sweet revenge. And as far as his brother, Jazz, he couldn't bear the thought of his younger brother surpassing him as a man. So he had to go. 
Elliot had only planned to do this if his father was out of town that week. Strangely enough, he had no intention of harming Peter. Next, Elliot planned to drive back to Isla Vista in the family SUV and take the lives of his housemates. He intended to use the apartment as a place to lure unsuspecting strangers who he would subject to brutal beatings and then ultimately kill. At the time, George Chen and Chang Yang Hong were living with him in their shared school apartment. On the second day, he would target the Alpha Pi sorority, which he considered to be the most beautiful dorm on campus, and after killing as many of them as possible before turning the gun on himself. In Elliot's distorted perception, he saw himself as a god, deserving far more than what he had been granted on this planet. Elliot's twisted preparations for his day of retribution didn't unfold as he had originally planned. His intentions to execute his stepbrother and his stepmother on the day came to a halt as his father's plans to leave town were canceled. Peter, Elliot's father, unknowingly saved his wife and his son's life by simply staying home. As a result, Elliot had to abandon his plans involving the SUV. But before he could proceed with the rest of his plans, he felt he needed to upload a final YouTube video. It's the day of retribution. The day in which I will have my revenge against humanity, against all of you. I'm 22 years old, and I'm still a virgin, and it's been very torturous. It's not fair, but I will punish you all for it. I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy, and yet you throw yourselves at all these obnoxious men. Instead of me, the supreme gentleman, I will punish all of you for it. You will finally see that I am, in truth, the superior one. The true alpha male. I will be a god compared to you. On May 23rd, 2014, Elliot began his violent rampage. He started by fatally stabbing his two housemates, George Chen and Chang Yang Hong, along with their friend Wei Han Wang. The three men suffered a total of 142 stab wounds. Shortly after, he sent his extensive 137-page manifesto to 34 individuals, including his parents, family members, and therapist. Within minutes of receiving this email, Elliot's therapist contacted his mother, who then contacted his father, Peter, who then called the police. Both Peter and Lee rushed from their home in Los Angeles and towards Isla Vista. But unfortunately, it was too late. Elliot's plan was already in motion. He initially headed to the Alpha Pi sorority house with the intentions of shooting everyone inside. But when his knocks at the door went unanswered, he retreated to the streets. There's where he shot three other women standing nearby. Catherine Cooper, Veronica Weiss, and Bianca Decock. Elliot then drove further into town near Pardell Road. He abandoned his vehicle and proceeded on foot. He then fired several rounds into the Isla Vista Deli Mart, and this resulted in the tragic death of Christopher Michael Martinez. Elliot then continued his rampage, targeting pedestrians and engaging in drive-by shootings while using his BMW to strike others. And during his confrontation with three responding officers, Elliot sustained a gunshot wound to the left hip, but ultimately managed to escape. Determined to cause as much harm as he possibly could, he drove his car into a cyclist nearby. But with no means of escape, Elliot took his own life by shooting himself in the head, finally ending the rampage. Soon the police would discover the bodies of three victims, followed by another three the next day. Christopher Martinez, a bright student from UCSB, he was tragically killed at the Isla Vista Deli. Catherine Cooper and Veronica Weiss lost their lives outside the Alpha Phi sorority. Veronica was known as friendly and cherishing her friendships and was known for being athletic. And Catherine was known for being academically bright, studying art, history, and archaeology. The bodies of Wei Han Wang, Chang Ying Hong, and George Chen were all found. Wang was a gifted computer programmer, looking forward to celebrating his 21st birthday. He was excited to visit Yellowstone Park. Chang Ying Hong was known for his kindness and his willingness to help others, while George volunteered helping the elderly. And whenever he wasn't volunteering, he was tutoring his friends and classmates. After these events, Elliot Roger would then be associated with the term incel. Just so you know, an incel is an involuntary celibate. It's an online subculture of people who claim to be unable to find romantic or sexual partners despite their desire to have one. It's also important to note that there were other factors at play. Elliot struggled with severe mental health issues. 
And I don't say that as an excuse because there are many out there that suffer with mental health. I mean, we all do at the end of the day in some form or another. But it's sad that nobody saw all the red flags and the warning signs before this even happened. But ultimately, the real tragedy lies in the six innocent lives who were taken. Watching all of Elliot's vlogs were definitely a little dark and they were heavy to watch. Because the more I watched them, the more it became obvious that this man was on a path of destruction. And it's just sad that his father, his mother, and nobody recognized the magnitude of the problem that they had on their hands. But I want to know your thoughts. How could have this been prevented and where did it all go wrong? Leave it in the comments below. In the meantime, I want to send a special shout out to everybody who supported and everybody who's left these comments encouraging me to make more, which I do plan to do. So whether you follow or not, you're watching this right now and I just, I appreciate you guys. And if you guys want to join the conversation, there's a link to my Discord below where you guys can be in the know with new cases that are happening, where we share videos, ideas, and just information on cases all around. So until next time, I hope you stay safe and I will see you when the lights go out.